us. Thank you very much for having me. Do you want to start off and just tell us a little bit about your childhood, where you grew up, and how you got into filmmaking? So um, I grew up in northern Germany. Uh, was born in a city uh, like near, close to Hamburg, north of Germany. And I think what's interesting to mention is that, like, my family slash my father, he was an engineer, inventor, um, mainly focused on um, how do you say, like, machine engineering. And um, my family was not so much connected to the arts, but my older sister, older brother, and me, we were all like very. Uh, interested into all sorts of uh, arts and uh, our parents supported us very much on that and this is like kind of I would say where the root is of all what what came in my career I would say um, yeah I think during school I, I always wanted to be a musician I always wanted to play music and um, I was always in different bands, playing bass, playing guitar, singing here, singing there. And parallel to that, I always had the camera, like stills camera to like document the shows and whatever. And uh, it kind of balanced out that it became like I became more close with the instrument of the camera than with my actual guitar um, or the microphone or whatever. So um, that's kind of where the path went. And yeah, my parents were always very supportive of that and I could explore and um, that's how it kicked off, I guess, yeah. Cool. And what kind of camera like, did you first have experience using? First? Oh, that's really hard to, really hard to memorize. I mean, I, there was some point when I finished high school, I knew I was, I wanted to do this and I was still like in bands and playing music, but I said, okay, like, I want to try to get in the film industry and I started I started assisting so I was basically I was clapper loader and focus puller that was all uh, on film no digital cameras around and same with my stills I think I had my first one was a Minolta and then I had a Nikon f like from like F2 from my brother um yeah this was kind of like the first stuff I started with Cool. And then, so when you were working in the, the, like, I guess in the film industry, you wanted to do narrative or even before that, like what kind of films were you inspired by? Or do you remember like the first film that you watched where you kind of thought like, this is cool. I want to do this. Or was it like a process over time? Yeah. I mean, I was, I was like, um, I think it was Mulholland Drive by David Lynch. That was like where I thought, man, like, this is so... Like, it is so, it twists your mind in a certain way. And uh, the camera work in it is not necessarily the, the, the tool that drives you into it. It's all sorts of, you know, the editing, the music and all. But all the collaboration of these arts that Lynch put together in that movie, uh, it made me so curious, like, of, of exploring how, how to, you know, how to do this, how to tell stories in this kind of, non-linear way and uh, that was interesting to me yeah yeah i remember watching that and the diner scene where they're talking and then the it's like the music builds up and they walk behind like into the back alley and then this like homeless like person in black jumps out it's like what the hell it's like so weird but it's like the way that they did it it's like so interesting like and that that's kind of like the spark that Kind of got you started and interested in film was there any other like um films that you after that you were kind of like you wanted to really dig into like did you watch other david lynch films and kind of study the craft to me it was always so it is at some point i when i was on film sets also as an assistant it became kind of like important to me to and i think it's important to mention the vibe that is on set, you know, like with the with the film crew that creates something, and not only on set, also in the pre like pre production preparing with uh, production designers and costume designers and art directors and all sorts of combined crafts that come together. And it this is like I think it's a little bit spiritual for me, but this is something I really 
uh, I really love. And then when I see a movie that has like this energy of, uh, you know, transporting me into a certain unknown atmosphere or a certain unknown vibe, um, this is kind of the same thing. And these relate to me uh, or co-relate. Um, so I don't know, another movie I would, I would love to mention um, this Paul Thomas Anderson, uh, like Magnolia or There Will Be Blood. That's like much later. I was already like persuading the, the, the career, but I was like, okay, this is kind of stuff that is so interesting to me. So intriguing, um, how all these combined ideas create a feeling, you know? Yeah. And was there anything like growing up in Germany at an early age that you kind of watched like cartoons or anything specific to like where you were, the area, the, you know, the sights and the sounds and the kind of, you could t probably talk about that was, I guess, different to what other people experienced. Hmm. That's a good question. Um, do you mean something that inspired me? I would say that nothing comes to my mind that I think is worth mentioning. That's probably like normal to you, but like what was like a normal day? Like when people think about Germany, like what does it look like? Like what are people doing? I guess it's the same as most European city. Like what you, did you grow up in a city or a farm or like what kind of things were you doing as a young child? After I finished high school, I lived in Hamburg, like in the city, which is like a, it's a smaller city. Then later I moved to Berlin where I live right now. And um, it has a lot of cultural things to offer. Um, but I mean, normal day, I don't know. Uh, nothing really specifically comes to my mind where I could say this is something that is like, that had influence on my work. I I do say like the moment I moved to Berlin, um, the cultural like um, opportunities you have to get inspired they just grow exponentially bigger. Like I kind of I grew up on the countryside and then I moved gradually to bigger cities. I also moved, lived in LA for a little bit, and and it's like this this you know information you can gain from you know galleries exhibitions also clubs or um all sorts of opportunities that are very inspiring to me so i kind of like the big city yeah so do you remember like the the first kind of car that you shot like was it the chevrolet commercial or there's like a mercedes one like what was the first like car commercial that you shot so um so the first like where i had like a proper client involved was lexus um and we kind of like uh there's like there's a few wide shots in it that are cg which is crazy because like literally i think it's like 15 years ago um and it was it's pretty good um and then we had a car for little close-ups and stuff but the client was in japan and we were shooting in berlin um but it was like a literal client involved and that was my first memory of of like getting getting this like a, like importance of attention to detail what the camera is doing with the car uh and then it, it, later on from from that job we get like the director and me we were like kind of we did a lot of jobs together back then and we generated work in china we traveled to china and i was i I was in China quite a quite a lot and did jobs back to back with like um, f based on this little Lexus job that we did. And and then it became more and more the clients were like, OK, um, uh, we interfere in a way appreciative, but we interfere like we want you to use this kind of lens for the car. We want to check your angles. We want to tell you it was like, don't shoot it from above, shoot a lower angle. We want a more we want a more dynamic or we want a more elegant. And all these aspects that are like, um, you know, like have like deep impact on my work. All of a sudden, these clients are like a lot to say with that. And they come to the director and me and say, OK, uh, please use use a 25 lens and do that. Um, that was pretty, yeah, kind of like the first memory I have of, of being really 
in the in the car ads, I guess. Yeah, because I've been talking to like a few other people, and they mentioned there's like a heights and angles document that they get that's generated by the manufacturer normally like some designer that says this is the perfect angle for the car to be seen at but a lot of times it's kind of like not film related so it'll be like on a thousand millimeter lens from four feet high it's kind of like that doesn't make sense so a lot of the times they kind of just have to throw it away it's also i mean right now it's changing a lot but this let's say this is like a how it used to be, at least like 10, 15 years ago, you get this document of certain manufacturers. Some give you more freedom, but others say, okay, yes, we want to we wanna use this lens from this height, and this is how the car is perfect, uh, reframed, yeah. Okay, cool. So did you learn a lot through doing, like, those commercials, like in China? Like, a lot, I'm sure there was a lot of traveling back and forth. Like, was it the the one director that you met and like how did you develop that relationship did you meet him in film school or how did that start no i didn't meet him in film school i right after so i kind of i, I graduated i did a feature film which was my kind of like final diploma let's say on the film school and then i moved to berlin and my, i signed with an agent and she introduced me to this director and immediately we we kicked off and then it developed like a five six year relationship where we shot everything together and um like i said a lot of music videos uh, and uh, he kind of made he pushed hard to get me into the career because like in the beginning as i mentioned earlier like to shoot the first car you have to it's like crossing certain barriers like people don't trust you with like um the arm car or uh, you know the, the light can he you know can he do the shapes and the design and all that can he do performance like portray performance and all this all these questions and distrust that is there you need to overcome that first before the client really says okay we're gonna let this guy um uh photograph our car and he pushed really hard for me and got me into that market um yeah yeah yeah, because I'm sure like there's a lot of guys that get to that position and then they kind of got a strong hold on it in terms of it's hard to break into, especially commercials. And like you said, car commercials, they're very particular of how they want their product to look. Did you have like a showreel that you kind of had that you were given to your agent that she would show to other directors or production companies? Like how does that whole like process work? Um, yeah, there was a showreel and there was like references and stuff, um, but I think in the end, and this is again what I love so much about the about the work, it is about chemistry, you know, and it's like, okay, eventually there is some director says, okay, I like his reel, but I got to meet and then you sit together and you, you know, you have a coffee and you actually like communicate and feel the room and feel the energy and see if like is this working or not working can i hang out with this guy for like i don't know 10 days in china in 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 in, in an art car or not and um that's how it kind of was i think in my case because um yeah it's i mean there's there's a lot of good reels but in the end what matters is chemistry i think yeah. right yeah cuz i know different countries have different like sense sensibilities in terms of humor and like jokes and so it was what the most of part like the early on were the they mostly german directors that you were working with no no i mean yes in the beginning yes but as i said then when i when i was in when i was in shanghai it was mainly local chinese directors i get to work with but then it was also, I came from the client because the client said, OK, we want our car to look like this. Who did it are this guy. So we get him. But we, I was hooked up with Chinese directors um, where we eventually didn't even speak the same language. But um, yeah, so that was kind of in the beginning, that was more it. And now since COVID, I'm more like I'm more hanging around in Europe, actually. Yeah, yeah. So what was it like working with like these Chinese directors? Like how would you communicate? Would you have like a translator or like what would that what was that experience like? 
I mean, I like shooting in sh like m most jobs I did in Shanghai, but generally shooting in China is uh, is it's it's a little bit different than shooting in Europe because the crews are there's a different pace, there's a different size, and the some things are more complicated than they are, let's say, in Europe or the States, and then other things are very easy, much easier. Uh, whereas you would think, okay, like doing pulling this off in the U.S. is just impossible. So it's like kind of hard to to learn and understand how production works. Um, but then at some point, it's it's it can be a lot of a lot of fun, like creatively also, yeah. But it's like um, I don't have so much of these Chinese jobs on my reel because it has a very different, very different language, and usually there's like a you know Chinese voiceover and a lot of um uh how do you say like letters and and typo um laid over so uh it's a it's a it's a different market i would say yeah we don't have to talk about it too long but like you, you mentioned like the american market is different to the chinese market well, like were they given a lot of freedom by like the the city to do the the work or was i guess dealing with traffic and all that's the same kind of thing as in like america yeah i think that's exactly the 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 spot where where the differences are um for example when you like you want to share you want to shoot on a very big street with high building skyscrapers in shanghai versus in la the permits like how to get the permits is such a different process and um how to get a permit of like uh putting a cherry picker with a big light somewhere um it's like it's it's very different but uh once you understand a little bit the mechanics um it can be also entertaining and and like i said like in in shanghai it's also i mean i was there always like a like a foreigner so i was given given a lot of creative freedom i would think Whereas, for example, I shoot in, in the States, uh, I, I'm not necessarily considered a foreigner in a way, or so like in Europe, obviously not. And then it's like creative freedom is a little bit limited, I would say, you know, I could not come to client an agency and say, um, uh, look, director me, we have an idea. I think it's going to look cool like this. This is not always going to work in China. They would always say, yeah, sure. Great idea. Let's do that. So, like, in terms of, like, freedom and, like, I guess, respect, like, were they very respectful and seen you as kind of like an expert, whereas you go to America or Europe, they kind of just see you as another another director of photography because there's, there's a million of them? Exactly, yeah. Simplified, uh, yeah, I would think, yeah. I mean, also, they, they take the effort of flying me over there just to do that, and then they want the input, whereas, like, um yeah here it's a little bit different like in europe or us you're like okay like you said they're like a gazillion of others and you know we just want want it to look the best however you do it like when you get this this kind of trust this is also on a movie if you shoot a movie and the producers and the directors and the, the showrunners kind of have a trust in you you can as a photographer develop kind of a stronger language i would say and this is like in 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 car commercial this this reads as well i would think you know like when 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 they when the agency has trust in the director he can push much more you know he can eventually come up with like stronger ideas and and all this but like as a collaboration obviously we, you know agency also has to have trust from the client and vice versa and all that and, and but i think um it's I enjoy if this is kind of like a fruitful environment, you know, where everyone can like chip in with little ideas without being, oh, no, no, we can't do that. We can't do that. We're scared of that. Um, and then it's like it's this is big fun to me. Yeah. So in terms of like the early on commercials and then throughout your career, you kind of saw like what the manufacturer or the advertising agency was expecting and they always wanted like this certain 25 millimeter lens at a certain height would you kind of capture the shots that you knew that they wanted and then feel free to like experiment and try and grab something different after that or like how did you kind of progress from doing just the standard shots that they always wanted 
It's depending. I mean, and also this is something is like this is a bit like of a retro. This is not like this anymore. The uh, I would say. But yeah, I mean, if if you're if you're on the racetrack and you're with your director and you're thinking, okay, man, um, we got this shot that is like on the storyboard. Let's do one more round where we do some, you know, experiment on a counter move and do like a weird angle. And if you get to do this, my experience is usually this ends up in the edit because it's it's so out of the box for everyone. Um, and if you get this uh, creative freedom um it becomes interesting and it becomes you kind of hit like the sweet spot where it's it's becoming uh yeah like new new grounds no, no one is really and i think some things a lot of things can be planned very precisely but then you get a lot of nuggets when you play around especially while driving fast you know and you have like all these elements that need to be coordinated very precise you know like if you're on a racetrack you're going like i don't know 100 miles with two cars and a camera on an arm and all this is like very dangerous so you need to be very precise but eventually if you experiment a little bit you get things that end up in the edit because they're unique and not planned or they plan out of the moment and you say okay man let's let's turn it around and look towards the the mountain instead of the sunset and all of a sudden it becomes total magical weird thing that you have never anticipated while on while you were scouting the location for example yeah, yeah so, so after that like so after the lexus commercial like did that lead to other car commercials specifically like what what was after that yeah like i said i mean this triggered the lexus triggered a lot of attention in asia like in china and uh, uh yeah mainly in china actually um and then it was only later that i got to shoot more in europe because um it's a very different language like less it's more not conservative but it's like more um a little bit more storytelling everything is a little bit more toned down whereas in china everything is like very it's very intense and poppy and um more how do you say um advertising language is is brighter in a way in terms of like the lighting and stuff like do you want to talk about like how you learned that and then kind of what techniques that you brought and like how you are able to create that Lexus commercial specifically? Like, was it in a studio? Did you have like certain lights that you were moving around to get those effects? Yeah. I mean, from from that Lexus one on, I kind of, this is where my curiosity was born of, of how these shapes and these beautiful designs that, that are put into a, a car, which is designed to have its shape um under the daylight so it's all based on light right and that was kind of like once i understood this it fascinated me how i could modulate shapes in the car with light you know like even like um like later on when you even like you, you, you shot a car and you know the car and then there comes a let's say a facelift uh, you know like a new um like a new part of the grill and the only way to work out this difference is with lighting and this became so fascinating to me because because it was the tool of 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 yeah of shaping and modulating the differences in the in this in these beautiful designs of cars and um yeah that was that was the fascination and that was born with this and we actually started experimenting with like it was me and the director with a little little flashlight and a little uh how do you call it the hot wheels car uh um, and navigating oh this happens like this and this happens like this this is how it got started like on little um experimenting in the hotel room and then we said why don't we do this and then we did it like in big scale i remember we did right after lexus we shot a um we shot a vw in china and this is again like 12 years ago i think or 10 years ago and we said let's put this car in this huge led cube and that was like long before like all the unreal engine and uh, um led caves and hyperbole systems got like you know um 
sparked on and and it was such a massive construction we just said man wouldn't it be cool and they did it you know and then all of a sudden we had the car in this in this big uh, uh cave of led walls and um all of a sudden light was the source of you know working out the parts the client wanted to see yeah yeah so in terms of like the lexus commercial like how long would it take to film something like that because it has a lot of different elements in inside of it like how many days would you be given to to create something like that Mm, so Lexus was a little bit out of the box because we were we were we had three elements. One was like the real car, one was uh, like talent shooting in Berlin, and then the other part was um, uh, how to say three um, uh, D, right? So it's kind of, and this all came together. I think we shot three days on it. Yeah, yeah. But and we're using. Thing is i think the vw the lamando i think it's uh, we shot this right after that and this is the one i was talking about with the led cube and i think we spent like four days in china in shanghai in the studio with that um and it was just like yeah it was big all this is very old work you know but uh yeah. no it looks brand new like you can't tell how old it looks like were you using like a high speed camera? Like what kind of cameras and lights and like the equipment people want to know, like what you were using in terms of the nuts and bolts of how it all went together? I mean, lately, I don't know, lately I shot a few like racetrack pieces of like high performance, you know, like the Porsche GT and um, I shot a Ferrari just recently this year and where it's all about high performance, you know, like the Ferrari is like over a thousand horsepower on the racetrack and how do you translate this? And obviously it is always in collaboration with the director when we say, okay, in order to tell the speed, we want to reverse and like use slow motion moments. And obviously then we use like phantom cameras to, to have, you know, particles in the air and then like, you know, rigging cameras to the to the car is also a big part of telling performance and tempo so and there you need like smaller cameras i i really like shooting this with like a small red komodo or like a the sony rialto piece that only works though if you have the body somewhere else in the car um yeah and then on the arm car is like I, i'm 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 a big fan of the venice lately sony venice um because i can like uh like i'm sitting in the arm car and i can change shutter and speeds very quickly um yeah so and then like do you have a favorite set of lenses or like a go-to lens that you kind of always like to use or not really no i own like i own my own set of lenses but i try not to use it too much because then it becomes you know uh you start repeating yourself and you always want to like have a little like something new and i wouldn't say i i would love i'm 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 a big fan of changing setups you know it's like you have to think okay what what is it the director is envisioning and then we see how can we get this and is it vintage lenses or is it more clear more sharp mm, and i think this is kind of the this is the way yeah Right, so yeah, experimenting, always kind of changing up like the different equipment that you use and then trying to push for something new and exciting and to keep, I guess, your reel looking fresh and trying to show that you're like flexible or capable of more than just one style. Which is kind of like in the industry, you know, I mean, it's either linked to people, you know, you know, the people or you're like booked by the style and they say, okay, we want a commercial that looks like that one. Uh, and then obviously you're kind of forced, okay, we use like, we use the Panavision lenses on this. So we're going to get them as well, just to get the same look. Uh, but I usually try to, to push for something in a, that, that changes that, you know, where you can say, okay, let's, let's, let's try something new because we've done that, you know. What was after that? Like, did you continue doing 
stuff in China? Like, when did you do like something in Europe? Or I think it was after that that I was finally trusted in Europe to you know to to shoot a car and to be in to be in the armed car and uh, yeah and and uh, clients started to you know accepting me. Um, yeah. What was what was so what was your first like experience in an armed car like going out and shooting the car like on a racetrack or on a road like what was that like yeah i mean i kind of i really i enjoy i enjoy the complexity of it uh and to me it's it's like a it is so technical but it is in a way it's an art form to orchestrate all the elements you know, you have the, the arm car driver, precision driver, you have the direction of the light, you have the arm, you have the focus, the lens, the zoom, and all these elements are moving at high speed eventually. And eventually you're outside somewhere on, on in the city in, a, in real traffic where you have to, you know, consider the roadblocks, rolling blocks or pedestrians or... So it's like a high alert, high complex orchestration of, of different elements. To get the shot and then you don't you cannot repeat it 15 times you get maybe like one or two chances to get the shot because then the light is behind the building or whatever so and all this precision required to do this this is something i really love because it 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 tensions your senses it heightens your alertness and and you prepare at pinpoint to something and um yeah usually it goes usually it goes it goes right and this is just like some a very satisfying feeling you know it's like all of a sudden you're in the arm car and you're like okay you you work eventually weeks to get a certain shot and then all of a sudden it happens in in five seconds and then you realize okay we got it we got the shot and this is just uh emotionally this is something i really love yeah Right. Yeah. So early on, um, you're doing a lot of cars in the studio, so you had control of the light and where you wanted everything to look. Like, what was it like going out into like a location and I guess not having that as much control? Were you able to kind of choose a time of day that where the sun would be in the right position or like, because I guess you you can't really bring lights to certain things unless it's maybe a night shoot or something. Like how how does that kind of go in terms of getting the the shot? Like do you like to have the sun at a certain angle or like how, what's the kind of stuff that you kind of focus on or try to push towards in terms of getting the lighting right? I used to not like shoot on location because I didn't have control. I was like, okay, uh, yeah, it's going to be 6.30 this time, the sun comes up, it's going to be perfect. But if it's a cloudy day, then it's not happening. And you're like, oh, okay, so what now? It's a cloudy day, we don't get it. And that was always disappointing. So I was like, oh, now let's be in the studio. We can control everything, we're in charge. But later then I realized, okay, there's also a beauty in this, um, in getting, obviously, like nature has the strongest impact and um on this on this object that you're filming the car and uh also then what differs from let's say you shoot a fashion commercial or you shoot it you shoot a movie um the priority of where the light is going to be when you shoot that scene is nowhere as high as it is in a car commercial because it affects so much the the way it looks so this i mean every cinematographer says okay we got to shoot this at this time of the day we got to look this way um, because then the light is right um and in car commercial like it is actually listened to a lot so this is also very appreciative whereas you know uh, when you shoot a fashion uh, ad it's like okay we want the light to be nice but we're not getting up it's at, at 5 30 a.m to go on that mountain get that sunrise right <laughs> so um yeah and are there any kind of like things that you avoid like in terms of like maybe reflections or like shooting the car like in direct sunlight like is it better to kind of shoot it backlit or like are there any things that you kind of you've done before and then 
the the client or whoever will say that's not acceptable like how how many like pitfalls are there yeah a lot i mean a lot it always depends on the car the car is a big reflective mirror and um, you can do a lot of things wrong and um, i mean at some point you have like some some knowledge of like okay i know if i do this this is gonna look shitty so let's avoid it from the beginning but um yeah like i said in the beginning i i shot a lot of studio which requires a lot of lighting and and there i learned a lot of mistakes to avoid because i did them <laughs> and then it's like it takes a lot of time to get rid of them and but it's fun also it's like uh yeah it's it's beautiful to work around these issues of, of reflection and and to really say okay um it doesn't look as good because this paint is so it's so matte we don't see the color pop unless we turn it more into the sunlight and all of a sudden we see the real color and um that is just something you yeah you you learn on on the way i guess yeah i did a lot of mistakes on that on that road definitely yeah so the the more that you can kind of talk about like what you've learned then others can learn from your mistakes as well but sometimes it's hard to like explain oh i overexposed this shot because you know if you look at the the white car it's all blown out but it's like how do you kind of teach that you know you have to learn sometimes just on location and it's good to learn from other cinematographers as like you said you started off as a loader and i'm, I'm sure you saw and experienced a lot of like on set politics, like when to talk, when not to talk, who to talk to, and kind of like that respectful aspect of it as well, like trying to learn from your mistakes, but also learning how it all works, you know? So I think that's difficult to, to teach in terms of, like you can read it in a book, but until you're actually there and seeing how it all is put together, like it's very, very difficult to teach that kind of stuff. Exactly. So, so do you remember um, after those first like studio commercials and then going to Europe and then like was it was there another commercial that you could kind of talk about and maybe break down and explain a few things about it? Mm, so I think like more recently, I don't know, like two, three years ago we did this we did this Porsche. It's a this is the, the, the GT. Uh, the blue car on the racetrack in France and that was like the director approached me and he said man let's let's make it crazy fast and that was the beginning of these FPV drones you know like where we not had like the Inspire that is like so slow and and showing landscapes but we had like fast FPV and and we had and he said man let's make let's make a crazy dynamic thing and um, and that was fun because the client trusted us a lot, and uh, and all of, and we had uh, it was not the first time, but we kind of like on the racetrack for me it was the first time to use FPV drones, and we were like just chasing these cars like crazy around the curves and hit, like going really really close over it, and this created so much dynamic, and and we got to the client agreed to uh, to use anamorphic lenses, and uh, so everything became more creamy, and we were like super excited about this. And we got to choose the right time of the day and it was a very um yeah it was a good experience in terms of like the free all of a sudden someone trusts you with the freedom to to to, to shoot something yeah i think what's worth for me to talk about maybe what i what i also find interesting in terms of because i was also like my my the film school i went to they they i also went there for for a workshop and i was teaching there and um it was like so such a great experience like with all the young dps like cinematographers who want to be like okay how do i do this how do we do that and and actually you mentioned it earlier as well was like it's it's so much i mean of course you have to make a reel and shoot good stuff but it's also so much like politics and 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 artistic collaboration and i think i i cannot stress this enough because uh to me this is kind of the core of of, of everything 
and um, so I mean I can I'm totally I'm totally happy to talk about lenses and, and, and camera setups and all this but I think what's more interesting is actually the psychology of you know like hooking up with the director and this is also what I love about the job you know like uh, collaborate with 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 an art director collaborate with an with a creator from the agency who has like this super great idea and you all chip in with 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 vision and all of a sudden it comes to life and that is something i find worth talking about and i think this is also what like uh yeah what is what is kind of the soul of this for me i mean i'm not necessarily like a I'm not a car nerd, I just love the beautiful design of it, but when it comes to the process of, of shooting a, a, a commercial, I like the I like the collaboration aspect of it, you know? Yeah, so like um, you mentioned, it's a collaborative process. As a director of photography or an artist in general, it's, it's very easy to fall into like the ego and think that you're better than everyone and your ideas are the best and what do they know? So yeah, to, to talk about that and say that it is a, a process, it is something that you have to learn over time, especially like going to China, like you could have fallen into that, like, oh, I'm like, they, they respect me, I'm, I know everything. Whereas, you know, always being open to other people's like criticisms or ideas or and in terms of like always learning, you know, not always thinking that you know everything and that like you, you're an expert. It's always good to, to be able to be open to ideas rather than yeah, having an ego and trying to like a lot of directors of photography or those, you know, associations say that you know, you have to be a good person to join, you know, if you have a bad reputation, they don't want to be associated with you. So I think that's something that's a very important and, and needs to be stressed, I guess, is it, that relationship. So how did you create your like relationships with directors early on? Like, what was it all about? Like, do you take them to dinner? They take you to dinner, lunch, like, do you talk? Like how, how much time is put into that relationship that you know it might not always be about the work but you kind of talking about life in general or like how, how does that kind of work i mean it depends it depends like every every collaboration is different every director is different and um some have like a more artistic approach others just want to have like a good restaurant and a good drink you know and it, like it meets all in between um but I, so you mentioned how important it is not to you know to 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 fixate on ego and say okay i'm 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 some sort of you know i know how, how this works i understand how this works since i'm the dp it's also the other way around because um eventually you know there's like self doubt which is like a big part of like of of when you shoot something and then the next job is just not happening and you lose a pitch you lose another pitch you lose another pitch and then they're like um you know there's like other dps shooting the jobs and all this and this is also part of 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 strengthening this this ability of um yeah staying staying awake and like being open to experiment and do new ideas um and not rely on long-term relationships also with like clients and agencies because that's also changing a lot i think every once in a while and um yeah i think it's 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 important to to know the gear and to know to know the, the technique and everything but i think more important is chemistry and uh because you never you know you never do this alone right and um how, how what's like i mean like i said i'm 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 a strong collaborator with directors like to me this is kind of the source of where the core starts of inspiration like when we have this intimate first you know like discussion of what we want to do like what is this project about and this is not only about cars this is on any project um and and from there you nourish like creativity 
Uh, and I think this is kind of what I what I enjoy, and I think people that w like to work with me, this is what they enjoy uh, to get this this yeah um, evolving with ideas. Uh, Where did you learn how to like talk to people? Like, did you do mistakes maybe early on where you you found that you upset people by saying certain things? Like, do you, do you kind of take into consideration maybe different people's thought processes and different cultural backgrounds and like how you communicate your ideas but also be respectful for their ideas like what's that whole like feeling through process like with you when you first meet a director like what do you talk about like how do you get along with them also very different very different there's very strong directors who have immediate like you know they know what they want and then there's directors who are very open to okay what do you think what do you what could we do with this and again i think my like, like being like shooting so much in in china or it's like also in japan and like it, it is like um since you you don't understand any, I, I don't understand any word. Like now I do a little bit, but I, back then I didn't understand any word, and I was like, like outside of everything. So it always felt I always felt like, okay, I am intruding someone's plan with my idea. So I was always I was hypersensitive on bringing in my ideas, and this kind of trained me to be very careful, but. Also, it trained me to, okay, eventually this is appreciated a lot when I give my input. And um, meeting meeting directors or meeting with the, with the creators from the agency and elaborating on, on ideas, on creative visions is, is always different because everyone brings a different energy to it. And... Uh, Who said that? I don't know. I don't think there is a way to learn un except just doing it, you know, just throwing yourself out there and saying, okay, um, I see it that way and then not take things personally when they're eventually not appreciated. Uh, there is always taste and there is always different styles. And once you're aligned on a certain idea, it can take a lot of time to really, also for me to really understand. And it's not just about you know sending moods back and forth with the director but like to you know to be on location and point somewhere and eventually you're like you're pointing to different directions because you have two different ideas of a scene and um but this is fun and this is i, I think there's a way no to no to learn artists. this but there is We're a way no of be, staying open you know i guess this is like this is what i would say is so that important that like you have to be you have to you have to have a strong understanding of He's what is visually because vision is kind of like visually is your, your what you bring to the table as the dp the but you don't well, have to eventually be offended if it's not taken or whatever like you know it's um yeah this is my approach at least i think so did you see anybody kind of like in your early days make mistakes or even throughout your career where they've like let themselves get I guess emotional and like they they like shut down like so you kind of learned from okay that's not what not to do. I was assistant for a long time focus puller to a very famous German uh, cinematographer, but like like old school. Um, he's not alive anymore, but um, he he was so rough. He was very successful, but he was so rough on his crew. And it kind of created this example to me that I said, okay, um, I think there's a way to get your crew to to do what you what you need with in a different tone, in a different tonality. <laughs> and that was a pretty good school, but um, because I then later I did it differently. I did it differently. You know? I said I don't want to. I don't want to show that anyone ever. You know, and I never did. I think. So in terms of like when there's an idea that's not going your way like how do you keep that frustration from boiling out and like making a scene out of something and where do you push like how far can you push 
Like you really wanted this shot, but they're saying there's no time or they want to do it a different way. Or, and you know that their way, it's going to look bad because, you know, the lighting's wrong or whatever, but they really want the shot. Like you kind of just have to do what they say and then try to push to get it your way. Like if there's time, like how does that kind of work when it's coming down to the crunch? Tough. I mean, I think it's tough. Then there is... And it's also tough to to mentally teach yourself to always say, okay, this is not personal. You know, this is just not personal. Uh, eventually, it is. I also had situations where stuff became personal, but but I have like, for example, there's a producer like like eight years ago. We had the sunset shot and it was the most beautiful light, and we're like, man, let's do one more run. Director and me were like begging. He said no. All right, <laughs> and we're still very good friends. But whenever we sit together, I always say, "Man, remember that time eight years ago in Spain when you said, no, not that shot anymore.' I still regret that we don't have that shot in the film, you know." And it's like I don't take it personal because I knew he was protecting his budget, blah blah blah. But <laughs> uh, yeah, it's 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 t it's like because you love what you do, right? You're like you're like so engaged, um, but it's not. It's law, like we're not doing heart surgery, right? Like we're selling cars. So it's, like, yeah, it's, it's not personal when someone says, man, no, no, we can't do it anymore. Yeah, and there must be like a temptation to kind of break the rules and go against what somebody said and just get the shot anyway. But does that lead to some, I guess, conflicts? If you do some, like you're disobeying somebody and you just go off and do something by yourself, I, I guess that could lead to something more than what you kind of thought it would. Yeah, super dangerous emotionally, you know, I mean, like in the in the in the complexity of a production, there are so many elements and someone is is always suffering more than the other with certain uh, pushing boundaries, you know. So, for example, like I was once in the in the car, and director and me, we said on the radio, "Yeah, okay, we wrap it," and then we did one more run, and that was super dangerous, you know, because everybody was like, the roads were not blocked anymore, and it was like it was so overstepping everybody, and it was dangerous, and I regret it, still regret it deeply. And producer was so upset, like she was crying, she was like, man, why did you do this? And we just didn't know, we were like so caught up in the moment, like of this. Oh man, it's, we've got to get this beautiful light and this, you know, and, and it's like, um, and it's also something I learned. I will never do this again, you know, like, um, it's a lesson. Nothing happened, but something could have happened, you know, and then whose responsibility is it? And, 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 um, yeah. But this is something also like, I mean, as much as this, the, the whole, like, I love the creative process and I love, you know um establishing a language a visual language and, and 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 creating a style or creating creating a film but then also there's always like people involved there's always so many human um stories involved and this is just so important to to to, to not lose the eye of like um while 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 you do it you know yeah because you know like you said you might have this like myopic view of like i gotta get the shot like the sun's perfect but then there's so many layers involved like from the producer like oh, the safety the stunt people like everybody has a role to do and and you might not know all the different like things that happen behind the scenes in terms of like if it goes over they have to pay everyone extra and they don't have any money and then if they don't like hit the budget they're going to lose their job so like there's all that pressure there and then if it's not safe like somebody could die you know and that's like the ultimate thing like another story on this is where it's like we're shooting a movie and the sun was setting and there was this ridge on the mountain and i said man it would be so nice to see the actor walking as a silhouette on the sunset but producer said no man we got a rep we got to go uh and i was like oh shit, okay too bad we can't do it and then what happened, the shot showed up in the edit. I was like, what, what, we didn't do the shot. And then what happened is that my, my assistant, my focus puller, he took the camera and asked the actor to do it the, the next day, the next evening when we had a down day. 
and they went on that mountain he did the shot alone the actor just walking in the silhouette in his costume and we have the shot and just like i don't know it was kind of like so beautiful because like i i like the director me said okay we don't have the shot but the camera assistant said man i'm gonna do it anyway for these guys because they're so cool and i asked the actor and he'll do it and they just did it as a two-man show you know and uh it was also something that was so i don't know it was beautiful you know so did you hire that that guy again yes oh yes we did a lot of films together yes <laughs> So do you think that is like one example of going like above and beyond like that is kind of acceptable because maybe you're not uh, doing anything dangerous and you're not doing it outside of the rules, I guess, but it's just, I guess he's volunteering his time. Like he probably didn't get paid to do that extra shot and he was just doing it because he wanted to make the film the best possible it could be. Yeah, and, and we were somewhere remote on an island. There was nothing to do. It was a down day. That doesn't justify anything, but I'm just saying, like, we couldn't have done it. And uh, and in the end, you know, like, the producer also said, okay, of course we're going to put it in the edit, <laughs> even though it was shot illegally in a way, you know. But this kind of, like, um, yeah. I think we have, like, this is a sister like me, we have, like, a loyal relationship and we shot so many films together. And this is also something I really like about repeating collaborations. You know, also, like, let's go, like, make the circle around back to car shooting cars. It's also so good to be with the same people, you know, and to have, like, kind of a establish a relationship with these people. You know, let's say the precision driver, you're on intercom and you're like, you communicate and you, you know, this person very well. And this kind of like makes, makes the, makes the, the process stronger of shooting together. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, yeah. I think it's kind of like a, a sports team where you want to be able to trust the other players on the field to do what you think they're going to do and do it rather than having a new person come in all the time and have to explain how it all works. And then it takes time to kind of build up that, like that partnership. And then if something goes wrong, you're like, oh, like blaming them because they didn't hit the focus or whatever it is. But those things are important because if something does, just one little cog in the wheel goes wrong, then the whole machine breaks down. So I think that yeah finding a, a good crew and a good team that you kind of mesh with and you, you kind of work well together like that's why you see like the Cohen brothers they'll always hire the same people over and over so they've worked it out you know the process in a way it's creativity together that is you know you you kind of overcame the the boundary of personality where you need to get to know each other. Uh, no, no, you're beyond that and you can focus a little further. Yeah. Sweet. And in terms of like the, the projects themselves, did you have any kind of like favorite commercial that you've worked on or like a brand in terms of the car stuff? Like was there a favorite brand or director or there may be like some standout moments that you kind of remember that you think were were memorable. I could there's there's a bunch of people I like to work with and uh, but no I couldn't I couldn't put a needle anywhere where I could say this is it this is, no no this this would be unfair to all the other projects also you know. <laughs> so what is that? like in terms of you want it to look a certain way in terms of the darkness and they say oh it's too dark and they're always pushing for more lights is that kind of like the that's kind of my that's my story i guess yeah yeah always always. Like, yeah i mean i like contrast um and i like colors and um yeah i mean there's so many there's so many factors who have an opinion on it uh, you know, and they come like everybody likes it, and then the end designer comes and says, "Oh, I don't see the rims. We can't have that." And then you open the you know, open everything again to see the rims. Um, so there's there's a lot of factors to be, you know, respected. Yeah, but I usually I 
I mean, I try to present a monitor to client and agency that is pretty close to what the director and me have in mind. Yeah. In terms of uh, other films, like there's one uh, Ferrari Lego on your. What was that process like? You're using like projector and a guy in a garage. Like, what was? How did that kind of work? I mean, that was kind of like a, like a small little project. Um, for so Lego had a collaboration with Ferrari and they did like a little Lego car, but then the the producer said, "Man, let's get let's get a car DP um, because it's a car, right? But it's Lego, so it's kind of like it was kind of an interesting thing. But the directors wanted to do like projection mapping on people, right? And we had like one day to 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 figure this out and to shoot everything. And it was kind of like this guy sitting in his garage imagining." How it would be to drive a Ferrari while he's putting together his his it's a one thousand piece Lego Ferrari and it takes about it takes a couple I think it takes three to five days to assemble it completely because it has the whole engine parts and everything quite interesting and we had one day to to film all these projection mappings of his imagination and I I really love this stuff because it is so experimental you know it's like. Uh, you don't know you have a testing day but you don't know until the day you're there with the real camera and the real lens and you see oh man okay so this thing doesn't work on his face we have to project it on the wall or his shirt let's change the shirt and it's like very inventive you have to invent the whole thing and um yeah projection mapping is 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 a bit yeah you need to play around with it to get good stuff and then in terms of the, the Ferrari SF90 film, like, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Like what kind of camera you used? Yeah. So this was like the, like the Ferrari on the racetrack was shot kind of like in winter time. And it's again, it's like this beautiful design car, like all the shapes of it are just like so elegant. Um, and we wanted to make it a performance film, but not fall into the trap of, you know, standard power photography and like sharp shutter and everything, uh, um, uh, no motion blur and everything. So we chose very soft lenses. We went with Panavision lenses we shot on Sony Venice at the arm car. And, um, and on that car, it was very difficult to rig a camera because it was, you know, it's like highly sensitive Italian piece of, you know, I think they built like 500 of these, as far as I'm informed. And uh, that was kind of like serial number two or whatever, and they were all pre-ordered. So <laughs> it was like highly sensitive. So really tough to rig on it. And um, yeah, and we wanted to to break a little bit. Uh, I mean, we knew it would be like a gray day with no leaves on the forest and all the racetrack is in the forest. So we knew it would look kind of not poppy so we kind of embraced that with an even softer lens vintage lens we shot on the um large format uh, uh artist panavision and the 70 primo lenses and primo zooms which are like they super soft fall off and and so we embraced all the motion blur and all the um soft edges uh yeah that was kind of the idea on this uh, yeah, and of course, like lots of FPV drone to to get the dynamic, uh, capture the dynamic. What camera do you use on the FPV drone? Well, it always depends on the pilot. I mean, I always I have some I have some pilots from Dubai. They actually rig a Komodo on it, you know, and they have a very strong FPV. Um, but it always depends. Always depends what they strip down. Yeah. There's some guys that about, have a Sony uh, stripped down naked and yeah. What about specifically for the Ferrari one, like the FPV camera and then like the slow-mo stuff, was that done on the Venice 2? Does that shoot that slow or is, did you have to get like a Phantom? We had a Phantom rigged on, a, on another picture car and we're like going very fast with the Ferrari and shooting like, I don't know, it's like 400, 500 frames on the Phantom, yeah. 
what's that kind of like handling like do you have to just do like short bursts and kind of check it or do you just do a round and just capture what you can and then i mean you, you line up you line up in a specific curve on the racetrack and then i mean you have like if you shoot 500 frames depending on the magazine you have on the phantom you have a couple of seconds so you know you always need to align the shot and then you know, rewatch it and say, okay, good or bad, do it again or not. So it's Phantom is always a bit, but it gets you, it gets you the, the it's, I love high speed because it kind of sweetens the moment of a very specific, very fast moment and slowing it down is so poetic. So I really love implementing Phantom. Uh, it's like, a, uh, it's a great tool. And it's only used for like a quick little second in the commercial where he's like, oh, let's find them all. <laughs> but it also is like, it's kind of bizarre because you say, okay, we want to, we want to, um, we want to emphasize the power and the speed and the performance of this car. And the way to get these moments magically is slowing it down. You know, it's like, so in itself, it's so poetic to, to, to what it does you know with your with your viewing of the speed and just, yeah nailing it to to something yeah that is actually slow and it tells the power of it you know in terms of like the camera shake like how do you do that and like is there a special rig that you use or you hard mount it or is it on the camera arm or is it a separate vehicle always also depends on the remote head you're using so on the Ferrari, we had a flight head, which where you can like, you don't have an external shaker box. You can actually program certain vibration into the head itself. So basically it kind of nulls or, or neglects the stabilization. And you can decide how much on which axis it kind of turns off the stabilization and that creates that shake. So it's like, a, it's a shaker program in the, in the remote head, yeah. Like, how did you learn that kind of techniques? Like, did you read it in a book or did you experiment or you learned it from other colleagues or directors? Like I said, it's always like different remote heads have different, different abilities of shake. And uh, I know from post-production, like like post shakes, sometimes they, they don't work as good. You know, because you see, you see uh, no motion blur. It's like kind of like a different, it's a different vibration. Um, and then once over the years, I get to shoot with different remote heads. You get to experience like what's the, you know, like Scorpio head or the Oculus or the Flight head. They all have different ways of, of getting them to these vibrations, which are like kind of faults in terms of what is their job, which is to stabilize a shot, and we kind of like force them to destabilize um but that is like i think it's experimenting yeah the idea is to kind of yeah talk to people like yourself and like figure out how did you do that and then you know take those ideas and experiment and figure out different ways of doing it obviously we don't have the the budgets to to get the the camera cranes and stuff like that but it's like we can try to emulate it on a lower budget with like these equipment that we have accessible to us but um, yeah, like the the I saw like there's a piece of equipment where it's they used on like um, Mark Jenkinson told me he uses on it's first started on Saving Private Ryan. It's like a shaker box that you put on front. Yeah, it's like the lenses move up and down. Yeah, do you use that that thing? Use it once because there's a rental here in Germany uh, uh, that has it. Um... I used it once. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. But it works. It's like kind of like an earthquake effect. You can't use it all the time because it kind of then it starts really blurring the image. What in my test at least. Um, but yeah, it's a great tool to use vibration. Definitely yes. Yeah, and then yeah, it's just like like you said, it's hard to do those kind of things in post production because you don't get those organic like feeling and, and you kind of see that it's a little fake sometimes. You, you can do it in post, but you always see the difference because it's missing motion blur. You can add that on, but then it looks digital. I mean, am I, I can, I can, I'm not saying I can always tell, but most of the time you can tell whether it's a, a post shake or a in camera shake. 
you know, especially as a DP, you're working with people, new people all the time. You have to be nice. You know, you have to be able to get along with people in terms of like to, to maintain that relationship. Like if you get a bad review or a bad like comment from some directors, I'm sure that would spread and you could get a bad name for yourself. Sure. I mean, eventually you don't have to be a nice person. I don't know. Uh, eventually results speak for itself, you know, like, uh, it's like, okay, this guy's like super asshole to be on set and to be around with, but the results are just amazing. Eventually this will also work. Um, I would, uh, I don't know. I, this may be also a technique that can work, you know? Um, and, and, oh, I don't think he's like attentive to be an asshole. I think some, sometimes it's just like, it's sometimes it's hidden sensitivity, you know, like eventually a person is very introvert or very shy and hides this in some sort of, you know, cover. And that may seem like super rude or may seem uh, um, super arrogant, but it's not. It's insecurity. And this is kind of like, you know, it's, it's complex, but it's working with people. And it's not a one man show like a painter where you're like, okay, whatever. Like I come to my studio today and no one, I close the door and no one bothers me and I can do with the painting with whatever I want. No, you collaborate with, with a lot of different characters. And, uh, and yeah, I think this is, yeah, this is what fascinates me. The, and also what resources are needed. I think it's a good final word. Like to, to the fascination is like what components are needed to, to be creative and to come up with good ideas for each person there's a different recipe and for each project there's a different recipe and it's so uh, to me it's just like interesting and fascinating to, to find out what are the best components for for me to to get the highest um output creatively or or uh, um yeah, in, in terms of collaboration, you know what I mean? Yeah, sweet. So so what are your goals for the future? Like, do you have any um, aspirations that you want to, like, accomplish? Mm, that's a very, <laughs> that's a good question. Like, what is, what is, what is, what is the goal? I mean, to be honest, I'm like, I can humbly say I'm in a, I'm in a good spot. And I love that I have the chance to 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 switch the worlds of narrative and advertising i love shooting advertising because you get to travel and meet interesting people and like have beautiful products uh and i love fiction because sometimes you like like i said i just finished a, a a show where we did like 70 shoot days and you grow together as a family with all the you know with all the crew with the actors and 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 you spend like months in like Morocco and you're like, you, you, you grow together and everyone's working to, to this little frame that you're having in front of your camera, this little sensor. And that is also beautiful. And I, I think my goal is to maintain this ability to shoot movies and, and have the blessing of like shooting advertising as well. Every once in a while, because shooting cars is also like big fun, you know? So I kind of like, I think my goal is to maintain this ability to do movies and commercials. And, uh, yeah. and yeah, I guess, sorry, and me and me, I mean, like, like the joy of the creative process is the people. I think it's like to meet people different uh, of all, all different sorts of energies and instincts and um, chemistries. And that is just, that is what I really love. And I hope it stays that way. So I guess in terms of doing both, like the it's like a lot of scheduling. So it's um, you, you're on seventy days here, so you're like I'm not available. And then when the directors are calling you, or they're calling your agent, I guess, and they're trying to figure out when you're available. Like, how much time do you get, like, to notice? Do you know, like, your calendar booked out? Like, in terms of a commercial, like, do they call you up? the week before, the month before, the day before, like how long do you get to kind of prep to, to get ready for these kind of shoots? So totally different. I think the scheduling, I mean, if you do a movie, you usually, you know, you read the script and then you kind of 
once it's greenlit, you agree to do it and you start scouting, there's a little bit more time. Commercial in Europe and the US is very short notice. I like it's becoming even shorter. Like you know, eventually um, the producer, the productions, they 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 pencil a bunch of DPs who are for a potential time slot, and then when the director wins the pitch, then it nails it down. Like who who can do it? So it's like always like, a lot of competition, and then it goes usually very quick. I mean, it's like. I don't know, maximum, I don't know. It, they can be short notice of two, three days. And they said, you got to fly out somewhere and shoot something. Um, I'm going to Korea in 10 days. And then it's kind of like a, like they, they confirm a DP a little bit longer ahead. Um, so you have like two, three weeks of preparation time. But uh, yeah, in Europe, it can come that like, oh, you're like, they call you on Thursday if you're available to fly out on Saturday. And then, do you ever say like no to projects for whatever reason? Do I ever say no? Yes. Yeah. I say no a lot. Mainly creative reasons where I say, okay, it's like not interesting to me, like artistically. Uh, and then, of course, you have to save your energies, you know, like sometimes you have to, you know, uh, be with family and stay, you know can't be traveling all the time yeah and then also with with scripts there is good scripts and bad scripts and uh, and sometimes there's good scripts and you just have to say no because you know i can't i can't do another six months uh, abroad and because then you know you'll get divorced or something you know? <laughs> it's always uh, seems to be a difficult thing to like have a relationship like with your wife and always be traveling and stuff but um in terms of like money do you have like a set kind of rate that you're like this is what i'm getting paid like so it doesn't really come down to money or sometimes do they say oh we've only got x amount of budget and then it's kind of like well i'm not going to do it like if it's off fix on this i think i mean it always depends i just shot like very interesting social campaign where there's no money involved and then i i'm if they i all the also music videos obviously they don't have the budget to to pay everyone like you know the high fees but if it's a cool project i come for just for the idea because i love the idea um so it always varies and you know and it all runs through my agent but like we, we say okay this is a great creative idea but we come for half the money of course because it's it's going to be something for the show reel or it's a great director I want to meet, you know, so I come for, for free or whatever. So this happens all the time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> everything's negotiable, I guess. It comes down to, to money. But yeah, like you said, if, if you're doing something for less money and then you miss out on another project, like it's kind of like that's the scheduling that, that it comes down to. Like it's very difficult, like you get called up for a film and you're getting not bad pay, but it's a good film. But then you miss out on another thing that's double the money. You're like, oh crap! So yeah, that's always kind of the thing where you have to. <laughs> that's the scandal of the game, I guess, because it happens all the time. You commit to something, and then something else comes along, and then ah oh, shit, I could have done, should have done, whatever. But that's it's part of it, I guess. Yeah. yeah, difficult to be a DP because you are just one person. You're not a business. You can't just hire somebody to do what you do. You know, it's very like you're an artist and people hire you for that particular role. Whereas, yeah. It's so beautiful because like, uh, yeah, eventually, like I mentioned this director earlier, like uh, he, if I wasn't available, he pushed, he tried to push the project, you know, because to, to get this collaboration going. And uh, that is also in a way that's, that's a beautiful thing, you know. That you can't, that is artistically not exchangeable so much, maybe. Maybe it is, I don't know. But yeah. <laughs> so, um, you've been giving us some great stories and great advice throughout, but as for like a an ending thought, is there any kind of um, advice that you could give to other 
kind of future directives of photography in terms of if they want to get into like filming commercials or narratives or specifically filming cars is there anything that you would kind of advise them to do hard hard to say i think i would always i would always think it is important to follow your instinct you know and and uh not be scared of you know uh of experimenting and trying new things and breaking boundaries or breaking uh, breaking habits i think so and and it's a people's business it's like it's all about human connection and uh of course stuff has to look good but i think if you get along with a person it's also um yeah, the process can be so enjoyable, and this is what it's about. I think you have to, if you love your work, uh, people will know and like working with you. I think this. Yeah. So you have to follow your gut, I guess. Yeah. That's what I do. Yeah, follow follow the gut, and yeah, do what I guess do you do it because you enjoy like the process, like you enjoy. The whole like interactions with people i guess if you didn't enjoy it you probably wouldn't have continued to do it like you would have found another job to do like i, I guess the people that stay in the job and are successful do it because they really enjoy it like is is there something about the the process that that keeps keeps you here you know brings you back project after project mm, i mean it is also exhausting. I mean, I'm like, um, I love working with people, but then also it's, it can be very exhausting to be around people, you know, like, um, it's kind of both, uh, it's a very schizophrenic thing. Like, you know, like, I'm not saying I'm introvert, but like, I, I also like, like to be alone a lot and, and I need this to, you know, to educate myself for creative reset and all. Um, but then on a set, you're usually, you know, you're like 40, 60, 70 people plus, and everybody's like kind of navigating around this little, you know, tool that you're sitting at or standing at. So, um, yeah, it's kind of both. It can, it's, it can be very tiring, but it can also be very refreshing. Uh, and I would, I would say the reason why I still love this, I mean, still, I just, I, I feel, still feel like I just started it. But um, I follow my instinct. I just say no to things that I don't like. And I don't work with people anymore that I don't like. And um, I like to give in everything I have with my, you know, creative um, authenticity, you know, like being real and say, okay, this is what I think is, is, is great art. So how do you navigate the people that you don't like? Like, what are some things that you kind of spot when you first meet somebody or you talk or you listen to their ideas? Like, what are some like red flags that you've kind of seen in the past where you're like, okay, this guy has the wrong idea or maybe they cut you off or they don't let you talk or they have different ideas or they're rude or like, what is it about that whole process that kind of turns you off somebody and says i don't want to work with them i think i mean usually like on advertising it doesn't happen so much because it's like you jump into something and then it's you shoot three four five days and then it's over but on a long project this is very important to 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 smell out if this could be a toxic situation because if you're stuck in it and shooting for for nine months in a situation where like um it can really affect your health, you know. So uh, it's read out. It's it's important to read out. You know, it's not about loyalty or trust, but but you have to uh, you have to trust in a way the the people you work with. Otherwise, it can like um, become very very unhealthy. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know how to how to. What's the tool? It's an instinct, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard hard to teach somebody 
how to navigate other people. Like I'm sure you, you could study psychology and there's probably lots of words for all the different keys, cues or whatever, but I'm just trying to think like practical advice for somebody that you've seen in the past. Like I'm sure with commercials, it's like you, the person comes off sometimes like in the initial meeting, they're great. They're like nice and easy going, but then when it comes down, they change and you're like, oh shit, I didn't expect this. But also the other way around, you know, like uh, uh, eventually you meet someone and you're thinking, man, this is like so, this is so tense and 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 he's so arrogant and he doesn't listen to my ideas or or, or she is so rude to me and, and I, I don't want to you know I don't want to be in this environment for so long and then you do it and then you realize okay all this is just source of insecurity or or um, being unsure of how to approach you know and then and then it gets better with trust so this is also something very beautiful that you can can turn like a first impression around, you know, when you say, okay, man, I, I get it. We, we were just like, we got off the wrong foot, but now it's like, my idea is not here to threaten you, it's to make your vision better. So, and then all of a sudden you feel like you can embrace stuff. So yeah, there's no real advice. Mind, I appreciate your, uh, I don't know, you like, you were very open to the, to the way where this led. And I was thinking, yeah, uh, I saw I saw the others, like some others. And it's like Rory. Yeah, I I'm not. I, I I don't know if we should talk about too much technical stuff because what I really care about is the is the emotional stuff and the collaboration and 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 yeah, how it goes, following your instincts, being emotional, being involved with people, and getting into extreme situations. And this is what I love about the job, and I I really appreciate that you kind of you created that space where we could like I could just you know talk about talk about that rather about you know I mean maybe we meet another time we talk about lenses and all that but I think this is also like super important to you know to talk about this emotional aspect of the work you know yeah because I find it interesting that everybody has their own role and you know there's the the guy that drives the camera car or has the arm and or the grip or the those guys are very technical in what they do but it's up to like the director and the dp to figure out the why you know the emotional sense is like why are we doing this what do we want the audience to feel and then be able to communicate it to all the different like crew like this is what you got to do and they might not be thinking like oh this is why but sometimes the good crew will will know okay i got to move the camera because this is an important time like we want to really emphasize this moment so even like the the technical guys that i've talked to they still understand it's all about the director's vision and we're doing this because of xyz sometimes the director won't tell them why they just do the job but they don't realize uh, until after they see the spot finish and oh, okay that's why we did that <laughs> i didn't even know that but everybody's different and i think yeah like talking to you about the the psychological factors behind why you do something why you use a certain lens like i know people get fixated on gear and like equipment but it doesn't really matter what camera you use as long as you know like the the reasoning behind like the camera move or like the shake or like what you're trying to achieve in terms of the vision you could use any camera it doesn't really matter so I, I appreciate you talking to us about more than just equipment and I think that's part of like what people want to hear is like the the whole story like why you guys do it and and why you continue to to keep coming back even though it's difficult and it's hard but you know what else are you going to do it's like something that you you really enjoy and there's plenty of worse jobs you could be sitting in an office you know typing some numbers on a spreadsheet not for everyone <laughs>